So we will begin uh, the next session, uh, meningococcal vaccines, with an introduction by Dr. David Stevens. So good morning. Uh, no controversy with these vaccines. So thank you. I'm introducing the meningococcal vaccine session. Uh, as I think most of you know, there are two uh, meningococcal vaccines directed at serogroup B meningococcal disease that are now licensed for persons age 10 to 25. Uh, these were uh, became available in 2014 and 2015. One is uh, Trememba uh, by Pfizer, MenB, FHBP. Persons uh, at increased risk for meningococcal disease, say three dose uh, series administered at zero, one to two, and six months, and a second series for healthy adolescents, uh, or a second uh, uh, program, two dose series at zero and six months. A second uh, uh, meningococcal B uh, directed vaccine, MenB4C. Vexera, uh, GSK, two-dose series at zero uh, and uh, greater than uh, uh, one month after the initial dose. In uh, February of 2015, as was uh, mentioned, uh, ACIP recommended that persons aged greater than 10 years at increased risk for meningococcal, for serogroup B meningococcal disease, receive a MenB primary series. Persons, and those are persons with complement component deficiency, including a complement inhibitor use, persons with functional or atomic asplenia, microbiologists routinely exposed to isolates of Neisseria meningitidis, and persons exposed during an outbreak. These groups uh, uh, are also recommended to receive a quadrivalent meningococcal uh, polysaccharide conjugate, MEN ACWY, uh, as a primary dose or series. And then these, uh, there's a recommendation for uh, this vaccine for a booster dose every five years, uh, therefore, as long as the risk remains. In 2000, June of 2015, also ACFP recommended that adolescents aged 16 to 23 years may be vaccinated with a MenB primary series based on individual clinical decision-making, a preferred age of 16 to 18 years. Uh, the question uh, today uh, uh, before us is about MenB booster doses. ACIP does not currently recommend men be booster doses for persons at increased risk for serogroup B meningococcal disease. This recommendation would be off-label a booster vaccination, uh, not, uh, currently not licensed. Uh, data and considerations of men be booster doses were presented at the February 2017 ACIP meeting. ACIP requested further data to inform policy options and additional data on immune persistence following a MenB primary series and immunogenicity, safety, and persistence of MenB uh, booster dose have been generated. The manufacturers have indicated that there would be no further data, however, are forthcoming. Uh, the OR group has reviewed uh, data on persistence of immune responses following a MenB uh, primary series and uh, also immunogenicity, persistence, and safety of a MenB booster dose, formulated policy questions and evaluated the quality of evidence for MenB booster doses. Uh, the, uh, uh, the activities, uh, the, the work group perspectives, uh, and, uh, and have developed a potential MenB booster policy and for uh, ACIP feedback, and we'll present that today. So, uh, this is the agenda, a summary of data on immune persistence uh, on, on MenB FHBP primary series and immunogenicity and safety uh, of the MenB FHBP booster dose uh, from Pfizer, a summary of the data on immune persistence following a MenB4B primary series and immunogenicity and safety of a MenB4B booster dose from DSK. Uh, uh, consideration of grade and evidence recommendations, 
and then work group interpretation of data and considerations of next steps. Uh, these are the work group members. I want to thank all of them, uh, and including uh, EACIP members. And uh, I want to also thank uh, Sarah uh, maybe for her uh, excellent work in leading this particular uh, study section. So thank you very much. And I'll turn it over now to uh, Dr. Uh, Palmer. So Dr. Baum will talk about immunogenicity and safety of MenBFHPB booster dose. Hi, good morning, everyone. So thanks for the opportunity from from Dr. Stevens and and Sarah and the members of the the working group that we've got this opportunity to share with you today our data that we've generated for on the safety and immunogenicity of a booster dose of MenBFHPB. So Dr. Stevens just went through this, just a reminder that for Membi FHBP, we're licensed for individuals 10 through 25 years of age. And this is for the prevention of Men B in this particular age group. There are two different dosing schedules for um, individuals at increased risk and those at uh, exposure to an outbreak. It's a three dose schedule. And for healthy adolescents, there's a two dose schedule that's recommended. Since it's been a while since we've had the opportunity to share some data with you at the committee, I thought I would just go back and remind everyone of the composition of our vaccine, but also to talk about the evaluation of breadth of coverage and the approach that Pfizer took to this. So firstly, Pfizer's MenB vaccine is a surface that exposed factor H binding protein. It's an important valence factor for meningococci and is actually in, involved in immune evasion. When we looked at an extensive collection of isolates from North America and Europe, we found that it was actually expressed in more than 95% of strains. Importantly, FHBP actually segregates into two distinct families, subfamily A and subfamily B. And it's very important if your vaccine actually targets FHBP that you address this by including one uh, protein variant from each subfamily. And so to do this, we included variants AO5 and BO1. <coughs> so as I mentioned, breadth of coverage is important for protein men B vaccines. Uh, we need to be able to deal with diverse men B strains, but obviously we can't test against every single men B strain out there. So the approach that we took was to use the serum bactericidal assay, which is the established correlate to predict protection. We selected four men B strains, which were prevalent in the US in terms of their clonal complex, which all meninge uh, epi people look at, and they're just shown in the table on the right hand side of the slide. These were the most prevalent complexes that were uh, observed in US data. And we selected four strains, which expressed the variants A22, A56, B24, and B44. Importantly, these variants are not matching the variants within the vaccine, and this allows us to evaluate truly breadth of coverage. So just to talk about the study designs that we have and work through the persistence phase and booster, obviously these studies take a long period of time and we thank all the subjects for uh, and investigators for their commitment to these studies. We had three parent studies, two of them, study 1010 and 1015, were actually three dose schedules. And uh, study 1012 had groups that received either a two dose schedule or a three dose schedule. These subjects were then rolled over into our phase three extension study, which was 1033. We evaluated persistence for 48 months. And then we gave a booster dose to subjects who originated from study 1012 and 1010 at 48 months and followed persistence out to 12 months and then 26 months. So I have one slide on an overview of safety. I'm going to focus mainly on the immunogenicity data. Um, this is the major topic that we have uh, for the booster um, series and persistence post booster. In terms of safety, what was observed is that a booster dose had a very similar uh, safety profile compared to the primary series. Pain at the injection site was the most commonly reported local reaction, fatigue and headache 
the most commonly reported systemic events. 3.7% to 12.5% of subjects reported an AE, and three subjects reported a related AE, with one of those, the influenza-like illness, it was classified as a serious adverse event. This was actually in a group from Study 1012 who received a two-dose schedule that was zero two months that did not roll through the entire booster and post-booster persistence phase. There were no reported SEAs during persistence phase post-booster up to 26 months. So I've split the immunogenicity data into two sections, just looking at the two-dose schedule and the three-dose schedule separately. So I'm just going to orientate you around this slide. We've got data for the four individual slides, and we're looking at the percent of subjects with a titer greater than or equal to one to four. We have pre-vaccination titers, then one month after the final dose, in this case at zero six months, the two dose schedule, and then we move through the persistence phase out to 48 months. So these are the data for the primary series here. So at one month post the last dose, you can see a significant proportion of individuals have got an SBA titer greater than or equal to one to four. And then it moves down, you see a decline at 12 months, and then it plateaus out to 48 months. Now, if we overlay the booster data, you can see that we get a nice booster response in terms of the proportion of individuals above this threshold one month after the booster dose. And if you look at the data for 12 months and 26 months post booster, you can see that persistence certainly looks to be improved. So that was the data for the four individual strains. Now we're going to look at data in terms of proportion of individuals who were able to make a response at this threshold against all four strains. And really we like to think of this as evaluating the breadth of coverage that the vaccine is able to give. The first point that I'm going to, to make here is bring your attention to the pre-vaccination data. You can see that it's extremely low. And this tells you that without vaccination, individuals find it difficult to mount an SBA at a protective level across several strains, across diverse strains. So at one month after the two-dose schedule, we can see that there are 73% of individuals are able to respond to all four strains. We then see the exact same profile as you saw on the previous slide, the decline to 12 months and persistence of a plateau out to 48 months. If we then add in the booster dose data, you can see that if you compare the pre-booster um, time point, which is actually the 48 month persistence time point, because the booster was given just after, then you can see the difference between a cohort that did not receive vaccine versus a cohort who received vaccine 48 months earlier. Quite clearly a difference between those two groups. Again, we see the booster response in terms of response against all four strains. This time it's up at approximately 92%. And again, similar to the previous data, we see against all four strains, the persistence certainly looks best, better post-booster. So I think you probably know what the three dose data is going to look like. It's probably going to look very similar. But first, I just wanted to share with you some data from the 1015 parent study that was performed in the US. And the reason I'm including this is just to show a control group. Um, we were not able to have control group throughout all the extension study. But in the 1015, we actually had a control group in the parent study. So these data just allow us to look at the profiles of the two groups, vaccinated with MenB FHBP, and also a control group over the one month post the last dose, in this case, zero to six months, and then looking at the uh, persistence time points, allowing you to give a comparison against the baseline at each time point. And you can see that the profiles as similar to the two dose, you see that decline after the nice response, one month after the final dose, but you can see that there is separation between the two groups until we get out to 48 months where we start to get some overlay in terms of the confidence intervals. So just going back to the same format, looking at the individual four strains for the three dose schedule, hopefully you're now orientated around these charts. You can see the, the response one month after the last dose on the zero to six month schedule and then moving across the decline, 12 months out to 48 months. 
if we look at the booster dose data, again, exact same profile as the um, data for the two dose schedule. And it shows that we get better persistence at 12 and 26 months. If we then look at the response against all four strains, very similar profile. We can see here one month after the last dose, approximately 84% of individuals are able to mount a response against all four strains. And the persistence profile looks the exact same. If we look at the booster dose data, a nice booster response, up to 100% of individuals are responding to all four strains. And the persistence of the proportion of individuals above this threshold remains higher post booster. So this schematic just allows us to compare uh, the two different dosing schedules that I've shown the data for. It gives a linear representation from pre-vaccination all the way through to 26 months post booster. Uh, I would just want to draw your attention to two sections of these charts. Um, the first point really to make is actually that they're very similar in terms of their profiles for two dose and three dose schedules. In actual fact, in terms of persistence post the primary series, we saw no difference irrespective of schedule, whether it was a two dose or a three dose schedule. And our parents that they actually had um, groups which had a shorter interval between the two doses as well. If you look at the persistence post the primary series, you can see that there's certainly a range observed for the four strains. And I think this is important because it gives you an indication of the range that you're going to see against strains which are diverse, that are not matching the antigen. And it gives you a feel for what the persistence against circulating diverse strains will be. Then if we look at the profile after the booster, you can see that the profile looks very different. There's a convergence of the range across these four strains, and it certainly in indicates that there's maturation of the bactericidal response, and there's probably going to be a better persistence of breadth of coverage. So for my final slide, just the thought on how we can interpret these data. So for high-risk groups, I think that these data certainly suggest that a three-dose series followed by a booster dose will enhance the persistence of breadth of coverage. For individuals at an increased risk due to an outbreak, the data also suggests that you could give a single dose of MenB FHBP to those previously vaccinated, and that would be either if they'd received a two dose or a three dose schedule. And the final point I just want to make is that I think what these data have allowed us to do is look at the responses over a significant period of time over this idea of giving a primary series and a booster dose. And I think we can see that the protective responses that have been observed against these diverse strains, expressing non-matched variants post-booster, really do give some insights into how we should perhaps use these protein-based vaccines and aim to prevent MenB disease across adolescents and young adults within the population. So again, thanks for the opportunity to share the data. Uh, I'd be quite happy to take any questions and try and answer them for you. Thank you, Dr. Palmer. Any quick questions for Dr. Palmer? <clears throat> Please, Dr. Atmore. Can you uh, reassure us that the uh, um, data for the persistence of antibody uh, in the larger group is, you know, for the subgroup that got boosted is you know, similar or representative of what was seen if you only analyzed the group that got boosted? In other words, that somehow the booster group didn't have baseline and persistent antibody to a greater degree than the larger okay. group that uh, some of whom didn't get boosted. Okay, so we, in the study 1015, the data that I shared with you, they received a three dose schedule, they did not receive a booster dose and the data between that group plus the subgroup that ran through to booster were pretty similar. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next uh, speaker will be Dr. Phil Watson from GSK on immunogenicity and safety of men B 4C booster dose. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for the opportunity to present to the group today uh, on behalf of GSK. Um, our intention is to help 
provide information that can inform the booster recommendations for MenB vaccines. And this presentation has been put together at the request of the, the Meningococcal Working Group. These are the main points that I'll be covering today. Uh, a recap on the vaccine attributes, the information that we've gathered in the past two or three years, followed by a review of the, the data pertinent to this particular policy question. So to begin, uh, a brief reminder that Bexero comprises four major antigenic components, FHBP, NHBA, NADA and PORA. Each has a distinct target and antibodies to each component are independently bactericidal, but can also work in synergy. Here in the US, as we heard from Dr. Stevens, Bexero has been approved since 2015 as a two dose series. Elsewhere in the world, Bexero is licensed from two months of age and several countries have implemented regional or national immunization programs. Bexero has been used extensively worldwide since licensure with over 30 million doses distributed to date. Vaccination programs have been implemented in a range of settings, including populations with infants, children, adolescents, and university students. The largest program to date, highlighted at the top of the slide here, has involved the routine vaccination of all UK infants. And in the three years since implementation, disease incidence has been significantly reduced in the vaccine eligible cohort. A provisional estimate of vaccine effectiveness is around 70%. UK authorities have also reported no significant safety concerns after the use of more than 3 million doses. Next, we have a, a quick summary of the observations from a large regional campaign in Canada, evaluated two years after program initiation. Again, disease risk was significantly reduced by vaccine use, this time in a population ranging in age from two months to 20 years of age. These findings, along with observations from Australia, the US and elsewhere, confirm that Bexera provides direct protection and has an acceptable safety profile. So I'll now focus on the data relating specifically to the policy decision at hand. Uh, this tab table summarizes the, the four clinical trials in which Bexero immune responses were evaluated in adolescents and young adults. These studies, as you can see, were undertaken in several countries with follow-up periods ranging from, four, from 11 months to seven and a half years. This table shows immune responses measured one month after the primary series completion in each of those studies. Across the board, robust responses to the two-dose primary series were evident, with between 68 and 100% of subjects having protective titers for the individual vaccine components. Safety findings were consistent across all studies. Most events were mild or moderate and resolved by day seven, and there was no evidence of increasing se severity after a second or subsequent dose. Now we include the immune responses at different time points after primary series completion. As we move from left to right across the table, the follow-up interval increases from 11 months in the UK to seven and a half years in Chile. Looking first at the UK, where responses were measured 11 months after vaccination, 85 to 97% of subjects retained protective levels of antibodies to the individual vaccine components. An additional analysis of the same data, included in the FDA approved label in the US, showed that serum from 66% of these individuals was actually bactericidal against all three of the indicator strains. Looking now at the studies with longer follow-up periods, it's evident that antibodies may persist at protective levels for several years after primary series completion. After four years, between 9 and 84% of subjects maintain protective titers to the individual vaccine components. And after seven and a half years, 29 to 84% of subjects maintain protective titers. In every study, antibodies induced by each vaccine component waned at different rates. At the longer time points, fewer subjects retained protective titers of poor A, suggesting that antibodies to this component may wane relatively quickly. This wasn't unexpected, and it's consistent with ob observations from studies of other OMV vaccines, and importantly, the clinical impact of this may be limited, as less than 1% of uh, men B strains are covered only by this vaccine component. It's also worth noting that across all four studies, immune persistence data were available from only 18 US subjects. Caution should therefore be exercised in attributing more or less weight to any one of these individual studies when trying to generalize for the wider US population. Moving on now to booster responses. We have data from two studies uh, in which a single dose of Bexero was given either four or seven and a half years after primary series completion. 
The orange bars show the percentages of subjects with protective titers prior to the booster. The blue bars show the percentages of subjects with protective titers after the booster. For all, co for all four components, robust responses were evident to a booster given either four or seven and a half years after priming. And whilst the values are not shown in this chart, the mean antibody titers after the booster doses were higher than the titers achieved one month after the two-dose primary series. The kinetics of the booster response has also been assessed by measuring geometric mean titers after three, seven, and 30 days. In both studies, strong responses to all vaccine components were evident by day seven. The reactogenicity of a booster dose has been evaluated in both studies as well. There was no evidence of increased reactogenicity after the booster compared with the primary vaccination, and adverse event rates were similar in the follow-on subjects and the vaccine-naive groups. The persistence of antibodies after a Bexero booster has not been studied in clinical trials. Limited data are available from a study in which individuals were primed with Bexero, followed followed for up to two years and then boosted with an investigational men men meningococcal ABCWY vaccine, which contained all the components of Bexero and those of a quadrivalent men ACWY vaccine. Here, the orange bars show immune responses after the Bexero primary series, and the green bars show immune responses after a single dose of men ABCWY vaccine administered two years later. The extent to which these responses accurately reflect antibody persistence after a Bexero booster dose is unknown, but we include them here for completeness and consideration. When trying to predict the longevity of disease protection after Bexero vaccination, the respective contribution of each vaccine component must be considered. As a reminder, circulating MenB strains are highly diverse and the prevalence and expression level of each antigen varies among strains. In the US, it's predicted that 91% of circulating invasive strains are covered by Bexero, and more than 47% of these strains are actually covered by two or more vaccine components. NHBA and FHBP are the two vaccine components that contribute the most to strain coverage. Since we know the prevalence of each antigen among cir circulating US strains, and the rates at which antibodies to each component wane, it's possible to integrate these two data sets and use modelling to predict overall disease protection over time. This table shows the results of that modelling using immunogenicity data from two different studies. Whichever immunogenicity data are used, overall protection is predicted to last several years after primary vaccination. This sustained effect can largely be attributed to the relatively slow waning of FHBP and NHBA antibodies the vaccine comp components that contribute the most to strain coverage. The more rapid waning of poor A antibodies mentioned previously has relatively little impact on protection over time because less than 1% of strains rely solely on this antigen for vaccine coverage. Modeling has also been used to predict the duration of protection after a Bexero booster dose. As one might expect, responses are predicted to be sustained for longer after a booster dose than after priming. It's also worth noting that these predictions of protection may be conservative because the underlying assays, HSBA and MATS, do not capture the synergistic effects between antibodies to each antigenic component. Before summarising, I wanted to remind everyone that the immunogenicity and safety of Bexero has been studied in individuals at increased risk due to underlying medical conditions, and these data were presented previously by CDC in 2017. Responses in children with asplenia or splenic dysfunction were similar to responses in healthy children. However, there was a trend towards reduced immune responses in children with complement deficiencies and those on eculizumab therapy. To summarize the data, experience from large vaccination programs has demonstrated the impact, field effectiveness and tolerability of, of Bexero in populations of all ages. Vaccine-induced antibodies persist to varying degrees for up to seven and a half years after a two-dose primary series. The integration of immunogenicity and strain coverage data suggests the protective benefits of a two-dose series may be sustained for several years, and a single booster dose administered up to seven and a half years after priming elicits robust responses by day seven. Higher titers have been observed after the booster dose than after priming, predictive of a more sustained response. 
In closing, a couple of additional considerations relating to MenB vaccination policy. It remains the case that sporadic exposure actually accounts for the majority of MenB cases in the US, not outbreaks. Secondly, in an outbreak where risk is substantially elevated, the priority is to quickly achieve high titers in the population at risk. In these circumstances, previously vaccinated individuals may already be protected from their primary series, and in addition, these individuals can be boosted quickly within seven days of a single dose. By contrast, vaccine-naive individuals will need two or three doses over a period of one to six months, depending on the vaccine, and recent publications have shown that series completion in this setting can be challenging and problematic. Taken together, these considerations highlight the value of men B vaccination at age 16 to 18 to help provide protection during the period of increased age-based risk. That concludes my presentation. Thank you all for your attention. I'm also happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Questions from the committee? Dr. Kawash? Yes, sorry, I might have missed this, but did you um, specify what your primary series schedule was? Was it 0, 01, 0, 02, or 0, 06? So in all of the studies that we've described here, the schedule was 0, 01, with the exception of the small study, which, which we had the MN ABCWY follow-up, where the initial series was 0, 02 months. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Okay, moving on to our next uh, speaker, Dr. Bozio. Uh, grade and evidence to recommendations framework for men B booster doses. Good morning. Today I'll be presenting on the evidence to recommendations framework, including the grading of recommendations, assessment, development, and evaluation for serogroup B meningococcal vaccine booster doses for persons at increased risk for serogroup B meningococcal disease. I'll present some background on meningococcal disease and our overarching policy question. I'll then delve into the ETR criteria, including grade, during which I'll present evidence for each criteria and provide the work group's interpretation. Meningococcal disease is a rare but severe infection that can progress rapidly. One in 10 persons with meningococcal disease die despite anti proper antibiotic treatment, and one in five survivors have long-term sequelae. The incidence of meningococcal disease has been low and rates are declining. We also see a decline in serogroup B disease, which accounted for approximately 40% of cases in 2017. ACIP recommends that persons at increased risk for serogroup B meningococcal disease receive a MenB primary series. Available evidence suggests that the antibodies wane in the years following completion of the primary series and MenB booster doses may be necessary to sustain protection. However, the goals of a booster dose may differ by the reason for the increased risk. Persons with underlying conditions or microbiologists need protection for as long as the increased risk remains, whereas among persons at risk during an outbreak, rapid short-term protection is prioritized. Our overarching policy question was, should persons vaccinated with a MenB primary series who remain at increased risk for serogroup B meningococcal disease receive a MenB booster dose? The population was persons who were at increased risk due to specific underlying conditions and microbiologists and persons during a serogroup B meningococcal disease outbreak. The intervention was a MenB FHBP or MenB 4C booster dose, and the comparison was no MenB FHBP or MenB 4C booster dose. The outcomes of interest related to the MenB booster dose are vaccine effectiveness, immunogenicity, persistence of the immune response, immune interference due to co-administration with other vaccines, and serious adverse events. For grade, we had a total of four PICOs two for each population at increased risk, and two for each MenB vaccine. For the evidence retrieval, we conducted a systematic review of studies in any language from these databases using the search string listed here. Efforts were made to obtain unpublished data. 
We included studies that presented primary data on MenB booster doses in subjects who received a licensed MenB primary series at at least 10 years of age. We also included an investigational combined SARE groups ABCWI meningococcal vaccine or men ABCWI booster dose as a proxy for the MenB booster dose if the MenB vaccine component was identical to the licensed MenB formulation. One study with unpublished data was identified based on presentations to the work group. Additionally, 131 references were identified in the database search. After screening the title, abstract, and article, four studies were included in the grade analysis. All outcomes of interest, their relative importance, and whether they were included in the evidence profile are listed here. Short-term immunogenicity of the booster dose, persistence of the immune response to the booster dose, and serious adverse events from the booster dose were included in the evidence profiles. Given the differences in the population and the goals of the booster dose, ETR was completed separately for each population at increased risk. The data reviewed as part of the grade analysis are included in, as supplementary slides, and the evidence included in the profiles is the same for each population at increased risk. I'll now present ETR for persons with underlying conditions and microbiologists, starting with stating the problem. The burden of serogroup B meningococcal disease among persons at increased risk is not well known due to limitations in national surveillance. The magnitude of increased risk in these persons can be up to 10,000-fold. Based on population estimates for each group, these persons comprise less than 0.1% of the U.S. population aged at least 10 years. Now I'll move on to the benefits and harms of the MenB booster dose, including grade. Regarding benefits of the MenB booster dose, no data are available on its effectiveness or duration of protection in persons with underlying conditions. Additionally, immunogenicity and, persist and antibody persistence to the MenB vaccine may differ in persons with underlying conditions. In a GSK study examining the MenB4C primary series, the immunogenicity in children and adolescents with asplenia was similar to that in healthy persons, but was lower in persons with complement deficiencies. Further, meningococcal vaccination may confer little to no protection in persons taking eculizumab. Regarding potential harms, evaluations including more than 69,000 healthy adolescents and adults have demonstrated the safety of both MenB FHBP and MenB 4C primary series. The undesirable effects of repeated MenB booster doses or in persons with underlying conditions have not been assessed. For GRADE, we evaluated data on the MenB FHBP booster dose from one unpublished study by Pfizer. This observational study was an extension study that included participants who were previously enrolled in a randomized clinical trial, or RCT, on the MenB primary series in four European countries. Healthy persons received the MenB FHBP booster dose 48 months after the two or three dose MenB primary series. No data on a comparison group were available. Short-term immunogenicity, persistence of the immune response, and serious adverse events were outcomes of interest. And as a reminder, the data reviewed for the grade analysis are included as supplementary slides. For the MenB FHBP booster dose, we evaluated evidence for short-term immunogenicity, persistence of the immune response, and serious adverse events um, from one observational study, though not all criteria were applicable. For all outcomes, we had serious concern for risk of bias, specifically selection bias. All of the subjects enrolled in the extension study related to the booster dose accounted for 14% of those who um, participated in the parent study. We downgraded for indirectness because data were available for healthy persons, but not for persons with certain underlying conditions. We also downgraded for imprecision because the small number of subjects resulted in wide confidence intervals regarding persistence of the immune response and may not be able to detect rare serious adverse events. The evidence type across these outcomes was a four, indicating studies with important limitations and the overall certainty of evidence was very low. Now moving on to the MenB4C booster, data were available from three studies. 
The two observational studies were both extension studies that included participants who were previously enrolled in RCTs on the MENB primary series in Australia, Canada, and Chile. Healthy persons receive the MENB 4C booster dose four or seven and a half years following the two dose MENB primary series. For both studies, the comparison group was MENB vaccine naive subjects who received one MENB 4C dose. Short term immunogenicity results were presented for each study separately, and data on serious adverse events from these studies were combined and analyzed as one study as per the vaccine manufacturer. The last study was an RCT in the United States and Poland and was also an extension study. Healthy subjects were randomized to receive a booster dose based on the primary series they received. The intervention was the MEN ABCWI booster dose with the MEN B component identical to that of the licensed product two years after the primary series. The comparison group included subjects who received the MEN ACWI vaccine as the primary series, but were MEN B vaccine naive, and one MEN ABCWI dose. The outcomes of interest were short term immunogenicity, persistence of the immune response, and serious adverse events. For the MEN B4C booster dose, we evaluated evidence for short term immunogenicity from two observational studies. We had serious concern for risk of bias, specifically selection bias. All of the subjects enrolled in these extension studies accounted for 41% of those who participated in the parent studies. In the Australia and Canada extension study, the racial distribution differed among those who enrolled versus those who did not enroll. We had no serious concerns with inconsistency, but we downgraded for indirectness because data were available for healthy persons, but not for persons with certain underlying conditions. We had no serious concerns with imprecision and there were no other considerations. Evidence was also available from one RCT, but not all criteria were applicable. We had no serious concerns with risk of bias, but we downgraded for indirectness because data were available for healthy persons, but not for persons with certain underlying conditions. Additionally, the intervention was an investigational MEN ABCWI vaccine, which was used as a proxy for the MEN B4C booster. We also downgraded for imprecision because the confidence intervals were wide due to the small number of subjects. For persistence of the immune response, we evaluated the same RCT and had the same conclusions about the quality of evidence for all criteria. For serious adverse events, we evaluated evidence from one observational study. We had serious concern for risk of bias as previously mentioned. We downgraded for indirectness because data were available for healthy persons, but not for persons with certain underlying conditions. We also downgraded for imprecision because the number of study subjects may be small to detect rare events. We also evaluated the same RCT and had the same conclusions about the quality of evidence for all criteria. The evidence type across these outcomes was a four, indicating studies with important limitations and the overall certainty of evidence was very low. Now we'll move on to the additional ETR considerations. From October 2014 through July 2018, 8% of persons aged at least 10 years with specific underlying conditions in commercial claims data received at least one MenB booster dose as part of the primary series. In comparison, 26% of these patients received at least one men ACWI vaccine. The low uptake in this group may reflect that the target population or their providers do not value the intervention, are unaware of the need for MenB vaccination, do not feel that MenB vaccination is programmatically or financially feasible, and or encounter barriers that may limit feasibility. In a survey of provider MenB vaccination practices, 81% of pediatricians and 56% of family physicians reported recommending the MenB vaccine for children aged at least 10 years at increased risk for serogroup B meningococcal disease, which may reflect their level of acceptance, awareness, or feasibility of MenB vaccination. Regarding resource use and cost, no published cost effectiveness analyses on the use of a MenB primary series or booster dose are available in this population. 
As far as feasibility, the data previously presented on MenB vaccine coverage and provided practices may signal feasibility challenges um, in implementing the MenB um, primary series recommendation. Consequently, feasibility challenges may be encountered for booster doses as well. For this population at increased risk, serogroup B meningococcal disease is a problem of public health importance. The desirable effects of the MenB booster dose may vary in persons with underlying conditions versus healthy microbiologists. However, the undesirable effects are likely minimal, but safety data on multiple booster doses are not available. The intervention of the MenB booster dose is favored, but there is very low certainty of the evidence. The target population may feel uncertain that the desirable effects are large relative to the undesirable effects, though there is important uncertainty in how much these persons value the main outcomes. A MenB booster dose is probably acceptable to key stakeholders, though it's uncertain whether the intervention is, any, is a reasonable and efficient allocation of resources or is feasible to implement. Although the work group did not reach a full consensus on whether to propose a recommendation for persons with underlying conditions and microbiologists, the majority of its members was in favor of proposing a MenB booster recommendation for this population. Now I'll present the ETR for persons at risk during a serogroup B meningococcal disease outbreak, starting with stating the problem. Serogroup B meningococcal disease outbreaks have occurred, accounting for 7% of all serogroup B cases in the U.S. Most of the organization-based serogroup B outbreaks are college-based, and 11 college-based serogroup B outbreaks have been reported during 2013 through 2018. College students are the primary group at risk for these outbreaks, who may have received the MenB primary series as healthy adolescents. While evidence presented here applies for all CER Group B outbreaks, all remaining slides related to outbreaks are focused on college students. Now I'll move on to the benefits and harms of the MenB booster dose, including grade. Regarding benefits of the MenB booster dose, no data are available on its effectiveness or duration of protection in U.S. adolescents or adults. In the four years following mass men B4C vaccination of persons aged less than 20 years during a regional outbreak in Canada, vaccine effectiveness was estimated to be 79%, though the confidence intervals were very wide. As far as indirect effects of the men B vaccine, no evidence suggests that men B vaccines reduce or prevent serogroup B meningococcal carriage, and therefore herd immunity is unlikely. Regarding potential harms, evaluations following mass vaccination campaigns during outbreaks at U.S. universities have demonstrated the safety of the MenB primary series. For grade, we evaluated the same data that pertain to the other population of interest. For the MenB FHBP booster, we evaluated data from an unpublished study by Pfizer, and this study was an extension study. For the MenB FHBP booster dose, we evaluated evidence for all outcomes from one observational study, though not all criteria were applicable. For all outcomes, we had serious concern for risk of bias for the same reason I previously mentioned. We had no serious concerns with indirectness. We downgraded for imprecision because the small number of subjects resulted in wide confidence intervals regarding persistence of the immune response and may not be able to detect rare serious adverse events. The evidence type across these outcomes was a four, indicating studies with important limitations and the overall certainty of evidence was very low. Now moving on to the MenB4C booster, data were available from three studies which were also evaluated for the other population of interest. The two observational studies were both extension studies. Short-term immunogenicity results were presented for each study separately, and data on serious adverse events were combined and analyzed as one study as per the vaccine manufacturer. The last study was an RCT in the United States and Poland, and was also an extension study. For the MenB4C booster dose, we evaluated evidence for short-term immunogenicity from two observational studies. We had serious concern for risk of bias uh, for the same reason I previously mentioned. We had no serious concerns with inconsistency, indirectness, or imprecision, and there were no other considerations. 
Evidence was available from one RCT, but not all criteria were applicable. We had no serious concerns with risk of bias, but we downgraded for indirectness because the intervention was an investigational men A, B, C, W, Y vaccine, which was used as a proxy for the men before C booster. We also downgraded for imprecision because the confidence intervals were wide due to the small number of subjects. For persistence of the immune response, we evaluated the same RCT and had the same conclusions about the quality of evidence for all criteria. For serious adverse events, we evaluated evidence from one observational study. We had serious concern for risk of bias as previously mentioned. We had no serious concerns with indirectness, but we downgraded for imprecision because the number of study subjects may be small to detect rare events. We also evaluated the same RCT and had the same conclusions about the quality of evidence for all criteria. The evidence type was a 3 for the RCT across the outcomes and was a 4 for the observational studies, indicating RCTs with notable limitations and observational studies with important limitations. Thus, the overall certainty of evidence was low. Now I'll move on to the additional ETR considerations. All 11 universities that had Sierra Group B outbreaks implemented Men B vaccination, which demonstrates acceptability of Men B vaccination by key stakeholders. First dose Men B vaccination coverage varied from 14 to 98 percent across these universities and may reflect the target population's value and acceptability of Men B vaccines, parents' acceptability and encouragement for their children to receive Men B vaccine feasibility concerns, especially at large universities, and differences in the student population, campus culture, and perceived risk of disease. Despite acceptability from stakeholders, MenB mass vaccination requires substantial resources. At one large university with approximately 20,000 undergraduate students, the total costs of vaccination were $1.7 million but the projected costs to achieve 100% primary series coverage were $7.7 .7 million. However, the strategy of MenB mass vaccination for outbreak response is estimated to be more cost effective than universally vaccinating all students at college entry. Overall, the high costs incurred by universities may reflect the belief that these campaigns were a reasonable and efficient allocation of resources. Since the booster would require fewer doses than the primary series, it's anticipated that MenB booster doses will be viewed similarly. In terms of feasibility, outbreaks required intensive coordination, significant human resources, and action among multiple stakeholders to efficiently respond within a short time. As MenB vaccines are not interchangeable, determining whether a MenB primary series was completed, the vaccine product, date of last dose, and ensuring availability of both, of both MenB vaccines may impact feasibility during an outbreak. Universities have demonstrated the feasibility of conducting mass vaccination campaigns for the MenB primary series under challenging circumstances, so administering MenB booster doses is anticipated to be feasible as well. For this population at risk during an outbreak, Sarah Group B meningococcal disease is a problem of public health importance. The desirable effects of the MenB booster dose may be large with minimal undesirable effects. The intervention of the MenB booster dose is favored, but there is very low certainty of the evidence. The target population may feel that the desirable effects are large relative to the undesirable effects, and there is probably variability in how much these persons value the main outcomes. We consider that the intervention of a MenB booster dose is acceptable to key stakeholders, a reasonable and efficient allocation of resources, and is feasible to implement. Therefore, the work group proposed recommending a MenB booster dose for persons at risk during a Sierra Group B meningococcal disease outbreak. In summary, despite very low evidence quality, the majority of workgroup members favored MenB booster doses and proposed recommending this intervention for both populations at increased risk for Sierra Group B meningococcal disease. I'd like to thank those listed here, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you for that. We're going to hold the questions until the next presentation.
Thank you for that excellent presentation. So we'll move on to the last um, speaker for this topic, um, which is Dr. Mbai, um, and it's work group interpretation of data considerations and next steps, and forgive the mispronunciation. Good morning. Today I will be reviewing the work group's interpretation, considerations for policy options, and next steps for Sarah Group B meningococcal vaccine booster doses. I will review the work group's interpretation of the persistence of the immune response following a Sarah Group B meningococcal or MenB vaccine primary series and immunogenicity and persistence of a MenB booster dose. I will also discuss the work group's considerations for men B booster doses in persons at increased risk for Sarah Group B meningococcal disease. And finally, we will ask for ACIP's feedback on potential policy options for men B booster doses. First, I will start with persistence of the immune response following a men B primary series and review the data for men B FHBP. This figure summarizes data for both a three dose shown in the purple and dark blue bars and a two dose shown in light blue bars, MenB FHBP primary series, with each panel representing data from baseline or pre-vaccination through 48 months post-primary series for each test strain. In these studies, seroprotection was measured as the proportion of subjects who achieved an HSBA titer at or above the lower limit of quantification of the assay, either 1 to 8 or 1 to 16, depending on the strain, which is more conservative than the 1 to 4 threshold used in other studies presented today. In these studies, initial antibody waning is observed 6 to 12 months following completion of the primary series and then remains stable. Thus, the work group's interpretation is that antibodies wane by 12 months following completion of a MenB FHBP primary series and then remain stable for up to four years in healthy adolescents. Next, I will review data from MenB4C. Four studies, each shown in a different color, have been conducted to assess immunogenicity and persistence to each of the four vaccine antigens shown in the different panels through seven and a half years post-primary series. The work group was particularly interested in the results for FHBP and NHBA, as these antigens contribute most to strain coverage in the United States. Because the study populations and time points assessed were different for the various studies, and generally speaking, antibody waning patterns for the four, vac four antigens were not consistent, I will walk through each study in more detail. A study in UK adolescents demonstrated a high proportion of subjects with seroprotection at 11 months following completion of the primary series. However, baseline antibody titers were high in this study, reaching nearly 70% for FHBP, and no data were available for NHBA. In a study from Chile, evidence of persistence through 18 to 23 months was observed, though subjects in, the, in this study also had elevated baseline titers. Although a substantial proportion remained seroprotected by seven and a half years, this proportion was not significantly different than baseline titers for most of the antigens. The work group felt that the, the populations in the U.S. Poland study, shown in blue, and the Canada-Australia study, shown in purple, were most representative of the U.S. context. In the U.S. Poland study, antibody waning was evident by two years following completion of the primary series, though confidence intervals were wide with relatively consistent results by four years in the Canada-Australia study for most antigens. Persistence following a men B4C primary series was difficult to generalize due to the heterogeneous results by vaccine antigens, different time points assessed in different studies, elevated baseline titers in two studies, and limited persistence data for NHBA. In light of this, the work group's interpretation is that antibodies wane by two years following the primary series in healthy adolescents and adults, though they may wane earlier. In summary, given the variable rate of waning between vaccine types and between studies, antibody persistence following a MenB primary series could not be generalized. It must also be noted that the two vaccines are completely different, and evaluations of immunogenicity and persistence were conducted using different strains and immunologic endpoints and thus cannot be directly compared. However, the work group felt that by one to two years following a MenB primary series, booster vaccination is indicated for persons who remain at increased risk. Next, I will review immunogenicity and persistence of a MenB booster dose, starting with MenB FHBP. 
Immunogenicity and persistence of a booster dose four years after completion of either a two or three dose primary series demonstrates a robust immune response at one month with gradual waning and evidence of persistence through 26 months post booster dose. Thus, the workgroup's assessment is that the immune response to a MenB FHBP booster dose persists for at least two years in healthy adolescents, and given the gradual antibody decay pattern, may last longer. Next, I will review data from MenB4C. Regardless of timing since completion of a MenB4C primary series, whether two, four, or seven and a half years, a robust immune response was demonstrated one month post booster. No studies assessed persistence of a MenB4C booster dose. However, following a MenABCWI booster dose in the US Poland study, shown in blue, antibody persistence was observed through 12 months post booster. Thus, the interpretation of the workgroup is that the immune response to a MenB4C booster dose likely persists for several years in healthy adolescents and adults. This interpretation is primarily derived through demonstration of good persistence of a men ABCWY booster dose through 12 months and modeled data presented earlier in this session by GSK suggesting persistence for several years. However, no further precision in the estimate was possible due to the lack of observed data. To summarize, a men B booster dose elicits a strong immune response and the persistence appears to exceed that of a men B primary series. Thus, the workgroup's interpretation is that antibody persistence of a MenB booster dose is likely at least two to three years and may be longer in healthy adolescents and adults. Next, I will summarize the workgroup's deliberations for MenB booster doses in persons at increased risk. First, I want to take a step back and explain why the, the workgroup is reviewing policy considerations for MenB booster doses at this time. ACIP recommended a MenB primary series for persons at increased risk four years ago at the February 2015 meeting. Starting in late 2018, several cases of serogroup B meningococcal disease were reported in fully vaccinated people, both in healthy persons and those with underlying conditions. Strain coverage analysis is still ongoing to assess whether these cases should have been averted through vaccination. Regardless, we expect future breakthrough cases to occur and thus felt it was time to start considering MenB booster doses. In addition, serogroup B outbreaks among college students continue to occur. As MenB vaccination coverage in the healthy adolescents increases under the recommendation for individual clinical decision making, an increasing number of vaccinated students will be exposed during an outbreak. Finally, both vaccine manufacturers have indicated that no further data are forthcoming. Additional data on effectiveness and duration of protection may take years to generate. Thus, the workgroup moved forward on reviewing data on the persistence of the immune response following a MenB primary series and immunogenicity and persistence of a MenB booster dose. The workgroup did not reach a consensus on either the need for or timing of MenB booster doses. A minority of workgroup members felt that there was insufficient evidence on safety and efficacy of MenB booster doses to inform policy options. However, the following slides represent the views of the majority of workgroup members. In terms of the need for MenB booster doses, the workgroup's primary consideration was that meningococcal disease is a devastating infection and the groups at increased risk represent small targeted populations. Available evidence suggests waning of the primary series and a booster dose elicits a robust immune response. However, this is based on HSBA titers, which is the serologic cor correlate of protection, but may not accurately represent the level of expected clinical protection. In summary, the workgroup feels that MenB booster vaccination is necessary to sustain protection in persons who remain at increased risk. Studies reviewed by the workgroup indicate antibody waning by one to two years following the primary series and persistence of a booster dose for at least two years and likely longer. However, immunogenicity and persistence of MenB vaccination may be limited in persons with underlying conditions, especially those with complement deficiency or complement inhibitor use. Thus, the workgroup suggests that a MenB booster dose is indicated by one year following completion of the primary series. Greater persistence is expected after the booster dose and thus a longer interval for repeat booster doses may be considered. Clinical trials and other observational studies have demonstrated the safety of a MenB primary series. Limited data are available on booster doses, though no serious adverse events have been reported. There are no data on safety in persons with underlying conditions and no data on repeat booster doses. 
Despite this, given the serious nature of meningococcal disease, the work group feels that the potential benefits of MenB booster vaccination outweigh potential risks in this population. The work group also discussed programmatic considerations for MenB booster doses. While harmonization with men ACWY is desired, the work group feels that the data do not support a five-year interval for men B booster doses, and thus harmonization is not the main priority. Additionally, the work group feels that the booster dose recommendations for men B FHBP and men B 4C should be harmonized to minimize unnecessary complexity in booster dose schedules. Outbreak situations come with additional challenges, and booster dose eligibility may be difficult to rapidly determine. Additional clinical guidance, such as updated language and CDC's outbreak guidance, will be necessary to facilitate booster dose implementation. Based on these deliberations, the work group considered potential MenB booster policy options for persons at increased risk. In persons at increased risk due to certain underlying conditions or occupational exposure, the work group felt that the available data supported an initial one-year booster dose, followed by repeat booster doses every two to three years. This conservative approach was felt to be reasonable in order to maximize protection in persons in whom immunogenicity and persistence may be reduced or in microbiologists who experience increased exposure. The work group also felt that allowing a flexible range of every two to three years would allow for some harmonization for meningococcal booster doses, as both a men ACWY and men B booster dose could be to give, given together every other time, which may reduce missed opportunities for vaccination. However, there are some potential downsides to this more complicated schedule, which may be more conservative than necessary. The work group also considered a standard interval, such as every two to three years, as it is more straightforward and prescriptive, but work, work group members felt that this may leave the target groups with insufficient protection for greater periods of time. During SARE Group B outbreaks, the majority of work group members favored a booster dose if it has been at least six months since completion of the primary series in order to boost immunity prior to antibody waning, thus maximizing individual protection during a short-term period of increased exposure. However, this is a more conservative approach than that proposed for other persons at increased risk without substantial evidence to support this distinction. Additionally, a six-month interval may send an inaccurate message on duration of protection of MenB vaccines, leading to reduced vaccine confidence. Thus, a one-year interval was also considered, as most people are expected to have protective antibodies through one-year post-primary series, though there may be some who do not. Additionally, a minimum one-year interval would be consistent with the proposed booster interval for other groups at increased risk. Regardless, the work group favors flexibility given the unique circumstances of each outbreak. Given these considerations, the work group would like ACIP's feedback on these potential policy options. For persons with complement deficiency, complement inhibitor use, a splenior or microbiologist, a MenB booster dose one year following completion of a MenB primary series, followed by MenB booster doses every two to three years thereafter for as long as the increased risk remains. For persons at increased risk during an outbreak, a one-time MenB booster dose is recommended if it has been at least one year since completion of a MenB primary series. A booster interval of at least six months may be considered by health, public health officials, depending on the specific outbreak vaccination strategy and projected duration of elevated risk. We are interested to hear ACIP's feedback on the work group's interpretation for the need and timing of booster doses, including whether the booster dose intervals should be the same for both vaccines. Also, are there any additional data that ACIP would like to see? Based on your feedback today, we plan to present policy options for a vote at an upcoming ACIP meeting. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. Thank you for that presentation. Dr. Talbot. Just watching. So I'm going to show some naivete, but is are both of these vaccines B cell I mean T cell independent? I mean, just because the antibodies wane, does that mean that there's no T cell response, or is T cell response take too long? Okay, it, that's these do induce a memory response, and and that's what the booster is really sh saying that there is a significant memory response being uh, elicited uh, in this group. So there there is uh, this is a a, a T dependent. Uh, 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 these are T dependent and introducing T dependent vaccine. But is the idea that if your antibody levels fall, your T cell will not have time? 
to create those yeah, antibodies. Yeah, it, it's been, it's, uh, there is a feeling that memory alone will not protect against meningococcal disease because of the short incubation period uh, within seven to 10 days of, of acquisition of the organism. And the second question is, are there any antigens? It looked like there was at least one antigen that's similar between the two vaccines. Is that correct? So both, both contain FHBP. Yes. So could a trial be done giving the alternate vaccine as a booster just I'm trying to visualize this as a college campus trying to buy a vaccine and vaccinate and asking college kids which vaccine they got or trying to figure it out mm -hmm. when they showed up. I just. Yeah, I, th I think we think that's one of the major challenges to feasibility is the fact that you need to the vaccines are not interchangeable and you do need the same um, dose. So I think we recognize that that's going to be one of the major challenges. It's also a major challenge for the primary series as well. Uh, Dr. Salaji and then Dr. Atmar. Dr. Yeah, Salaji. hi, thanks for a very nice presentations. Uh, just a really minor point about um, uh, implementation. By the way, I, I, do, I do support these, uh, the work group uh, suggestions. Um, for the patients with complement deficiency or asplenia, you know, you presented um, some data about, quote, values based on the low vaccination rate. But I would suggest that that's not really data on values. And for these patients, many of these, most of these patients are also taken care of by pediatric subspecialists. And you also presented data that the majority of pediatricians, actually 81% of pediatricians, um, favor vaccinating these patients. So I think this is more of a rollout or lack of, lack of uh, information rather than a, a concern about values. Dr. Grandmark. So, I, I guess um, I was always worried a little bit about the meninge uh, B, the, the, the sero stat, ser serologic status after primary immunization falling off and, and the duration of protection potentially being shorter. Um, one of the things that concerns me about the booster data uh, is that the intervals of when the boosters have been given are longer than at least for uh, the, the first uh, vaccine that was discussed than what is proposed. And at least with other vaccines, that interval of boosting can affect, you know, the magnitude of response. Um, but, you know, I, th I think the concern is a reasonable concern, and, and it sounds like we're going to have to make a decision without a lot of data. Uh, uh, but... The rationale is, is there. The, I, what I would be interested in, and you alluded to, and I'd like to know whether we'll have this information by June, is you know, the, the vaccine, uh, parent vaccine failures, and what, you know, information about the strain, what's the duration of time from a completion of primary series to infection. So we get some idea uh, about um, when these failures have, have occurred and, and do the proposed intervals uh, make sense in light of those kinds of data? Yes, we, we do anticipate having more information available in the next coming months, um, and so we can certainly present an update. We wanted to at least signal this issue to ACIP to let you know that this was happening, though we just don't have all the information right now um, related to the strain coverage and you know, underlying conditions that people may have and things like that. So it's something we can prepare. Dr. O'Leary. Yeah, Sean O'Leary, Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society. Um, thank you for some really clear presentations. There was a really nice slide that, that showed that for the um, high-risk population, about 269,000 uh, at risk in the U.S. Um, what's the, my understanding is that, for, particularly for the immunocompromised patients, that it's usually not serogroup B. So what's the burden of disease in that population? How many cases of, of serogroup B disease have, has there been in that population considered at risk? in the so, last several years? It's a great question, and we didn't actually present that data because we do not have great information at this point. We've, you know, we collect some of this information historically through ABCs, which represents less than 15% of the population 
meninges, meningococcal disease is so rare right now that it's, it's not going to be very representative and it's a small number. We are starting to collect some additional information through our enhanced meningococcal disease surveillance for the past couple of years. But what we've noted through doing more in-depth chart reviews through ABCs is that there's very few number of patients in the database who report of having even had complement deficiency tested for, let alone a diagnosis. So we're just not confident that that information is being captured through the surveillance mechanisms we have. So we just don't have a great estimate on number of cases and their serogroup distribution at this time. Dr. Walter, did you have? Yeah, I'm just curious in the outbreak uh, situation, under what conditions would you expect to go down to a six month interval versus the one year and how would that get played out in, a, in the outbreak by the public health officials and maybe some of the other people that have done that would like to comment? Um, yeah, I know Kelly, uh, yeah, we can. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. How you got to uh, yeah, how would you how would you make the decision to go down to a six month? So one of the concerns that I had expressed was that because we know that this vaccine has less impact on nasal carriage than the um, men C4 does, um, that and we have had evidence of breakthrough disease occurring in people after mass vaccination on a college campus. Um, one of the outbreaks included a case that occurred after everyone else was vaccinated and a visitor to the campus because the virus, the strain was still circulating. Um, and so the concern was if people have an outbreak that starts at the beginning of a school year and they're 10 or 11 months out since their primary series and their, their increased risk of exposure may occur throughout the entire school year. Um, as opposed to an outbreak that's identified at the end of a school year, right before everyone disperses. Uh, maybe it's a freshman instead of a senior. And, and in addition, there are also questions about how easily can they get the records and, and do you want to be strict about a one-year interval. But it was those sorts of incredibly specific things that might result in, in saying, we're only going to do one mass vaccination campaign on our campus, and maybe this person isn't going to come back in two months when it's been more than a year, so we'll just do them all now. And so those were the sorts of very practical operational considerations that could come into play, and that's the reason that it says it should be considered by public health officials as opposed to individual clinicians. Thanks. Dr. Zahn. Yeah, thanks. I'm Matt Zahn with NATO. I, I think that thinking through trying to vaccinate thousands of kids uh, in, a, in, a, in a school when they've been potentially exposed, if you talk, think about the figuring out who should get a booster and what's kind, it's complicated, but it's already getting pretty complicated. You know? So if we don't say we're going to do a booster, booster at all and we vaccinate you know, several thousand kids, how many of those kids will inadvertently get boosted because they just didn't realize you know, what they were getting before anyway versus right versus wrong? You know, kids get a meningococcal. You know, do they know what kind of meningococcal vaccine they got when they thought that they got it before versus not? I think it's just really difficult. And I think whether we do a booster or not, and this is just me thinking, you know, Kelly, others may think it better than me, but I think that we will run a, a, a either we vaccinate a whole bunch of people and inadvertently vaccinate some people extra, you know, with the wrong booster, or whatever, or you get really, you know, aggressive about making sure it's exactly right, in which case you'll probably vaccinate a lot less because they just won't go home to their mom and get their, you know, and get their, their vaccination status. So I think it's already complicated as it is right now as you respond to an event, just how I think about it. Thank you. Dr. Manuel. Yeah, thank you. Um, as you know, we've struggled in the American Academy of Pediatrics with the um, Category B recommendation as it is for healthy children. Um, and I have a question for you about persons that increase during an outbreak, because now you're putting healthy people into an at-risk group. And that's a huge step. And the question is, how are you going to define those risk groups? Do they fall into risk only during an outbreak? Um, and then if you're backing that definition out, does that mean that everybody then should be considered at risk if they're going to college? And I thought we'd already dealt with that issue and the very small numbers of uh, uh, cases in that age group and half of which whom are not even in college. So um, it, it raises a whole bunch of issues that just need to be very clearly defined because our pediatricians are, as you know, are struggling with this. So one question I have specifically is 
Do you know what the, you mentioned 7% coverage for uh, the first category of at risk. What about the second group, the persons at increased risk during an outbreak or, or healthy kids otherwise? Yeah. What are the, and, and I, I know you don't have strain information, but if you at least have the coverage rate number. And then the second question, sorry about this, is if, so you're, I guess, following up on the previous question, I guess you're gonna assume that somehow if somebody knows they're already immunized that they should get a booster during an outbreak. But, um, so I guess you're gonna have to ask that question or are you just going, I mean, how, how are you gonna differentiate? And I think that, that may be, a, it may be difficult to decide that and, and so I wonder how you're gonna resolve this when you're actually in the middle of a large outbreak. Yeah, so in terms of your first question, um, our coverage data based on NAS teen suggests that um, about 17.5% of 17-year-olds have received at least one dose of MenB vaccine. Um, that data, we don't have information from that particular survey to talk about survey um, series completion, but other sources of data suggest that 50% of less so far have actually completed a series who have started it. Um, so it's low, but it's it has been steadily increasing um, ever since the recommendation um, came into, um, into being. Um, so we, you know, we don't have any information on coverage specifically among college students. We expect that it's probably higher than that observed for the, you know, general adolescent population. Um, and so what we're really talking about for this group is that people who have been identified by public health officials to be in the at-risk group during an outbreak. Um, for most of the university outbreaks that have happened so far, it's been all undergraduate students. But that's, those are decisions um, that are not really part of the ACIP language. It's, you know, once it's public health officials who determine that a certain group is at risk during an outbreak, that's the, you know, then vaccination recommendations are made. And we have CDC Sarah, outbreak guidance for that. Um, so, so Dr. Maldonado, you know, there is somebody from AAP who's on the work group, and it would be great if AAP may be offline since we're running out of time, would help us work through how they might suggest we finally thread the needle that we're talking about here, because we recognize the clinical difficulty of it, but there's also the part about the data on the waning immunity. So maybe we could take the actual practical applications of it a little offline. Very good, so two more questions and then we're gonna have to close this. Uh, Dr. Bernstein. Is there any uh, data about this, the use of, since they're not interchangeable, do we know what, what data colleges are collecting as far as the specific products that are, uh, have been received by their students? What we've heard you know, from our colleagues in college health, including those on the work group, is that a lot of colleges do not have this information readily at their disposal. Um, you know, MenB vaccination is not mandated by most universities at this time, so there's very little record keeping and that um, it is a challenge during an outbreak to know the vaccine status. That's true, um, like we were talking about, even for primary series, it's a challenge to know. Should we be encouraging that? Uh, I understand an, a growing number of colleges are requiring it, and I wonder whether it should be more explicit as far as which product that uh, they receive. I also understand that there are an increasing number of camps that are requiring um, receipt of men B vaccine before going to camp beginning at the age of 10. Mm. Maybe I'll defer that question to Dr. Benz. Hi, this is an even American College Health Association. It's true that we don't have a good record of, of um, which schools, um, very few schools actually require men B vaccines. I will say that when we get all the immunization records from students, I mean, that information is known. It's just that they, the students don't know it and it's, it's typically in a scan database or it's, it's in a not easily accessible form when an outbreak occurs. And I think the variability of, of entering students in terms of MenB vaccines, there's definitely more entering students with it than before. But knowing that um, your, your campus may experience an outbreak at some later point and the immunity wanes, so I, th I think that the outbreak recommendation is still the strongest one and that there's ability to mobilize even though it's so difficult it happens so infrequently that that the resources combining health uh, public health recommendations to identify the smallest 
at the earliest opportunity group to, to begin the um, vaccination um, out, outbreak is, is, is feasible. And then having, if it's a prolonged outbreak, then, you know, a six month time period, really there's only two months um, where the six month would fall in June and July. I mean, otherwise it's gonna be during, um, you know, it's gonna be during one of the months that uh, classes are in session, so. Thank you for that very good discussion. Um, so we're gonna close it here.